probably the first Seventh-day Adventist sermon you will ever hear in your life, and maybe the last that begins with a quotation from Charles Darwin. The, t- the title of this presentation is The Eyes Have It. And here's what Charles Darwin, in his infamous, if you will, a work called On the Actually, On the Origin of Species is is not the whole title, but most people use that to represent the long title. This is what he wrote. To suppose that the eye, with all its inimitable contrivances, you and I don't use that word very much, do we? (laughs) Inimitable means uh, unusual, remarkable, mysterious, and a contrivance is uh, some kind of a machine or some kind of a, of a, of a, of a uh, action. So the eye with all of these amazing features, he says, which include, just to name a couple, adjusting the focus. Everybody knows you're looking at a book maybe and your eyes are focusing and you look up at a mountain uh, 10 miles away and without even thinking your eye focus is there, you know about that. And everyone understands how the iris admits different amounts of light. You walk from a dark room into a light room or vice versa, and it takes a moment. uh, But your eyes do this without you even telling them to. Here's a couple of them that he mentions that are more challenging for correcting spherical and chromatic aberration. Now, aberration means something's not right. And uh, the idea that your eye is an eyeball, and it is a ball, because it's spherical, it actually causes a problem in your vision. You probably didn't know about this. Chromatic is a fancy word for color. So I'll show you what that is in just a moment. So this idea that there are some built-in problems, but the eye fixes those. Now he goes on to say, that all of this could have been formed by natural selection. Let me make sure this is clear to you. I need to spend 20 minutes on this. I'll try to do it in one minute. Everybody in this room, I think, knows that inside every cell of your body, there's one one exception, there's this ladder that's twisted in opposite directions, top to bottom. Am I right? What's that called? That's the genetic material we call DNA. You probably don't know, most of you wouldn't know, that the function of DNA, you know, what it does is it (coughs) directs and organizes the building of proteins that your body needs. The protein you and I eat, we do not use like it is. Our bodies cut it apart into pieces. And every cell in your body makes all the proteins that you need when and where you need them. And that production of those proteins is organized and directed by the by the DNA. Are you all with me on that? And so what he's saying here is this thing that scientists call the Darwinian function. Here's, here's what they mean by that. That uh, By accident, and this happens in all of our bodies, actually, thousands of times a day. By accident, one of the rungs in that ladder gets damaged. Our body actually fixes most of those, but uh, a certain number of them don't get fixed. And when one of those rungs gets damaged and it's not repaired, which happens in all of our cells every day, actually quite a few times, some protein then that the DNA would direct in making is now slightly misshapen. It's not quite correct. Did you follow that? Please say yes. And these mutations, you know that word, that's, that's when the, one of the rungs gets damaged. These mutations cause all kinds of problems. The biggest issue for most people is cancer. But uh, here's what the evolutionists believe. 
They believe that when the first cell was ever formed, and they have no clear idea on how that supposedly happened, they believe it had DNA, and that that cell would have multiplied and grown into some kind of a little organism, a fly or a worm or something simple. And they believe that by accident, when a mutation occurred in that one cell, because the protein it would now make was a little different, it would make the offspring of that one cell be able to live a little better than its brothers or sisters. And uh, then that one would survive where the others might not. And they actually believe, this is amazing, folks, and if some of you believe this, don't misunderstand me. I respect anybody's choice to believe what they want to believe. But the idea that this could happen is ridiculously small. They, in other words, the evolutionists believe that by accident, every worm, every bug, every frog, every creature that exists on the earth, including people, with all of the amazing things that our bodies do, they think that all of that was formed by one mistake at a time in the ladder. Got that? You all with me on this? Well, it's more than, it's, it's, it's not really faith, but I understand what you're saying. So Darwin is admitting he, he could see that what goes on uh, in people, I'll try not to get too close to anybody. He could see, uh, he thought th that he could imagine how that could have happened by accident. By the way, when Darwin was alive, we didn't even know that there was such a thing as a molecule. There was no knowledge of such a thing as a cell. But he believed that all of this happened by this accidental one, one rung at a time mistake, one mutation, would make a offspring more fit. Y'all with me? I'm kind of repeating myself. But when he looked at the eye, he said, I don't know how that could have happened. That's what he's saying, if you will, in this first uh, thing I put on the screen. That it could have been formed by natural selection. That's a phrase, natural selection, which refers to this mistake every once in a while by accident. He says, I freely confess, it's what? Absurd what? That beyond imagination. See, it's amazing that he wrote that. Absurd in the highest degree. So I'm going to take a few minutes this morning. We didn't sing the song together that was listed. Uh, my, my, uh, it, it, page 111 uh, about God's mighty creation. I'm gonna, I want you to just get a little bit of a sense of what's going on in your eye and hopefully just make you more committed and amazed that your, your creator's handiwork. So I have a diagram here of the eye. You might be interested. You know this. The light comes in, and there's this lens that makes the light focus on what we call the retina. And uh, then you see something. The retina actually covers almost the entire inside of the eye. It's actually made of 11 layers of cells, 11 different kinds. And the whole thing is about the thickness of saran wrap, this thing that all of you know about called the retina at the back of your eye. And I'm going to take a little piece of it. And actually, the artist has pictured this. And I'm going to put that on the screen alone so it's a little larger. So here, here is the, the top layer of cells, and there's the bottom layer, if you will, top and bottom or front and back. And if the light comes in here, uh, it's supposed to end up making, you all know about this. I think even the children in school will have, will, are aware of the fact that your eye has these things called rods and cones, uh, which, which sense, are sensitive to light. And uh, I don't know if you can see from where you're sitting. I'm looking at the thing at the back of the room, and that's maybe farther than you are. But can you see that some of these things the artist has painted 
like the green arrow looks like a rod. Y'all talk to me, please. I'm an old teacher, folks. You have to talk to me. And uh, can you see that some of them look like a cone? And in fact, uh, there, are, there are cones that see red, uh, cones that see uh, blue, and cones that see uh, green. Now, they're not colored. The artist colored them so you could see there are different ones. You all kind of know about this. And uh, then there's another rod there. I think you know that the rods are designed to sort of see bright and, bright and, and dark or black and white, if you wish. And these cones see color. You can remember that because color starts with a C, cones. And uh, then there's all these layers of cells in between, which I'd love to take a lot of time. I won't this morning except just a couple of little things. Uh, then all of these rods and cones, you probably didn't know this, are actually nerve cells. You know, your body's full of nerve cells. If you poke yourself, it hurt because there are nerve cells that detected that. And it turns out that these rods and cones are nerve cells. And I think most of you would agree or would know that ev every nerve cell in your body, there is no exception to this, has a, I'm going to use wire that ends up connecting with the brain. Are you all with me on that? You think about that, folks. God is an amazing electrician. Anybody in this room an electrician? One? One? one not a soul? You all know this. They have to hook wires up in the walls everywhere to make everything work, don't they? Well, in your brain, there are, listen to this, 300 billion neurons or nerve cells. Everyone has a wire that has to connect in the right place. And in the retina, there are 150 million rods and cones. All of them have a wire uh, that has to somehow connect. Let me show you how this works a little bit. Uh, this last arrow that came on the screen, uh, and then the brown one that I just drew, that, uh, let me see if I can point. Uh, I'll use just one picture up here. This little brown, dark brown thing is all of the wires coming together, going to the brain. You all with me on what I tried to describe? What do we call that bundle of wires that goes back to the brain. Somebody said it. All of you heard it and know what he means or what is meant. The optic nerve. It's actually a misnomer. It's a nerve. It's a bundle of one million nerve fibers. It's not a nerve. It's a million nerve fibers. The interesting thing is that the 150 million wires that come, to, that come from the rods and the cones 150 million signals, if you will. It's like somebody, uh, it's like somebody's at a switch. I wish there was a switch right here. And for every single rod and cone, somebody is going on and off, on and off, on and off, whenever there's a little bit of light. Y'all with me on that? And sending an electrical signal. The interesting thing is that 150 million of these are reduced to only 1 million. And that's the function of all those cells in between. If you, if you could imagine 150 million kids around this room, each at a switch, y'all with me? And somebody up here is orchestrating so that any one moment, only a million of them uh, can run their switches. Got that? You're not saying yes. All right. It's an amazing thing, folks that these 11 layers, about nine of them, are involved in this business of deciding which switch they're going to use at this, at this moment. Now, most of this, Darwin had no idea. Nobody knew any of this, what I'm describing for you right now. But he still sensed that there was something awfully amazing about these things in, in your head. Um, and I'm just showing you that it was a thousand times more than he had any idea. Now, here's an interesting statement. So here's all these rods and cones. And here's an interesting statement. Uh, there's the 150 million reduced to a million wires. I'm going to show you. I'm going to use a telescope instead of a lens. I'm going to show you what the problem is quickly. 
that Darwin referred to. Uh, it tells us it's easier to understand with a telescope than a lens, and, and, but it's the same thing. So here I think you can get the point. Uh, some light comes in from a distant star. The light hits the mirror. It's reflected back to somebody's eye looking in the telescope. Y'all with me? You got to talk to me, folks. Okay. And if somebody says no, I'll explain it again, or at least I'll try. I want you to raise your right hand and repeat after me, everybody. Here we go. I promise I'll say no if I didn't understand. This young person didn't raise his hand. I'm going to watch you now. Okay. Now let me show you what happens if the mirror is shaped like a circle. Your eye is a ball or a sphere, and the lens is shaped like a circle because it's part of the ball. And I'm showing you this with the mirror because it's easier to get the idea. If the mirror is shaped like a circle, or if the lens is, which ours are, then the light from the outside edges of the lens or mirror focus in one place, but the light that comes to it from uh, closer in focus at another place. What would that make what you look at look like? Out of focus. So when Darwin said, that the eye corrected for spherical aberration. That's what he's talking about. Are you all with me on that? He at least understood that much, which I'm, it's quite remarkable that that long ago he comprehended that issue. Uh, he was a good scientist, uh, not a believer, of course, so what can you do? If you're not a believer, everything that's out there had to come into existence somehow. Isn't that right? And if you're not a believer, you'll say, well, it had to happen somehow. See? So he was a good scientist. He had lots of issues like all of us do, but uh, nevertheless. Uh, now this, this is interesting. Every time you throw something in the air, I don't care what it is, a baseball, you drop something and it flies a little bit, it follows a certain curve, a certain line that scientists have a name for. I hate to even tell you what the name is, but it's a parabola. You kind of know that word. And it happens that if you shot a baseball up in the air, it would follow this curve. Are you all with me on this? And if it turns out that a lot of things that we toss to somebody, it's just a little piece of the top of the curve, if you will. And if you make a mirror of that shape right there, then the light that hits the outside or the light that hits the I guess I should just do that picture over again. The light that comes in from the outside or the edges all focus where? Where? At the same place. Are you all with me? Now, I'm just trying to help you see what the problem is with the circle of the, of the, of the lens. The, the, the body does not fix it by making a parabola. I just want you to see kind of the idea that scientists have figured out how to make things focus. All right, so um, that's the spherical problem. The eye is a sphere. What about the color problem? This is interesting. Everybody in this room, even the kids in grade school, I think, have had the teacher either show them or have them look in a book that when Newton put this little piece of triangle glass with a piece of light coming through the broken shade, what did he find out when the, when the light hit the mirror, or hit the, the prism? It got separated into what? colors, and, and it was the first time anybody knew that white light was full of what? Different colors. And uh, would you agree with me, and the reason that happens, I won't get into detail right now. I'd love to talk about it as an old physics teacher. But would you agree with me that the top of that lens is actually like a prism? Everybody? Can you see that? All right. And so the red light gets bent less than the blue light, and what is true about the image? It is, you're not getting it. The different colors get bent different amounts, so when you look at the picture, what does it look like? Blurry. 
Y'all with me on that? That's the problem. You're not all talking to me. Some people even have their eyes closed. Ready now? Open your eyes. The image would be blurry because the colors are not focused in the same place. Does that make sense? So Darwin understood that, and he called it chromatic aberration, color, color problem. See, he understood that that, was the, that that should happen, and the question is, uh, he realized he realized that the eye fixes both of these things by itself. And he said, ah, that couldn't have happened by accident. You got it? Amazing. All right. So if this is the, if this is the retina, it would have, you know, it's, it's going to be blurry because it had, would, it's focused in different places, the different colors. All right. And he said, this couldn't happen by accident. It's absurd. And still, he believed it happened. Now, when you make a camera in your iPhone or any other nicer camera, the, the scientists have figured out how to fix that. I won't get into detail. They use a different kind of glass, and it makes the colors come together. Different shape of a lens and so forth. We teach all that stuff to students in physics. Now, the world's most famous atheist today is a man named Richard Dawkins. How many have ever heard his name? Can I please see your hands? Now, the rest of you have heard his name, right? So everybody could raise their hand. I'm surprised that more of you didn't know about him. And uh, he's an arrogant, I won't say any other words. Uh, and uh, this is what he writes in his book called The Blind Watchmaker. Any engineer would naturally assume that the rods and the cones would point toward the light with their wires leading back toward the brain. Are you all with me on what he's saying? An engineer would say that that's the way you should build the, the eyeball. He would laugh at a suggestion that these uh, photocells or these rods and cones would point away from the light with their wires uh, going back uh, Actually, I'll show you is what he's meaning here. They get in the way of the light. And he says, any engineer would know better than that, but this, this is what happens. This is the way the eye is made. Let me explain to you what he's, the claim he's making. He's saying that if somebody had designed the eye, they wouldn't make it the way it is. So that it was by accident that the eye got made and it wasn't quite right. Are you all with me? You understand his argument. He's using this to say there wasn't a creator because he got it wrong, if there was. Very interesting. And Dawkins, I don't, he's alive today. I don't know if he knows what I'm about to tell you, or I don't think he would have said this. This is a, a drawing. So the wires, so the rods and the cones are on your right, and all these layers of cells, the artist has sort of drawn some of them. And over here, uh, is, are all the wires leading from the eye to the brain, correct? How many wires in that bundle? One million. What do we call that bundle? The, the optic nerve. That's it. So here comes the light, the way God made it, and it gets down here to the back of the eye finally and uh, stimulates the rods and the cones. Now, the way that God, that God fixes this, it's interesting, is something similar to what scientists have discovered today. Everybody has heard of, you know, fiber optics, right? You probably all know that in that big yellow bundle, that big yellow thing you see, the, they're digging out along the road and they're shoving that yellow wire in there, right? It's, you probably know it's a bundle of two to three hundred little tiny, not much thicker than a hair, a little plastic uh, wire, if you will, plastic, uh, piece of plastic, and you can shine some light in the end of it, and it will come out the other end of that thing, no matter how long you make it. I'm going to illustrate that. Here comes some light, and this bluish, greenish thing is a, is a piece of plastic, a little fiber, and the light comes out the other end. It even comes out the other end if the light got bent on the way in. It doesn't lose any. This is the amazing thing about fiber optics. It doesn't lose any light. In fact, even if the wire, even if that fiber optic thing is bent, you don't lose any light. It stays inside. Got that? And God did that with a cell, 
uh, here comes this light. There's the optic nerve again. There's the rods and the cones. Uh, he did that with a cell. This has only been discovered several years ago. And the artist has drawn this cell. Uh, it's a nerve cell that does, uh, does what the fiber optic does. It's in yellow. And the idea is that if some light comes in and hits that cell, instead of the light getting lost and smashing around through all those layers of cells, it's like fiber optic and it gets piped right down to the rods and the cones. I wish you all would have said, wow. Are you all with me on how this works? The light gets to the rods and cones in spite of the fact that there's all these layers of cells there. And the scientist that, that figured this out is a man named Mueller. And so these are called Mueller cells. Got it? And uh, this has only been known recently. And not only does it pipe the light clear to the back where it's needed, it also, the little cup, is big enough to catch the separated colors. There's the cup. Can you see the colors that are separated? Everybody? It's, the cup is big enough to catch them so the image is not blurred. Got it? That is wow. And when your optometrist has you set your chin and shines that very bright light and they're looking at the retina, all they can see, if you will, is little cups. There are so many of them that the entire surface of the retina is little cups. Now, those little cups and all of those things are so thin, you can see through them. You can see clear to the back of the retina. You can see the blood vessels and so forth. But it's cups everywhere so that the image is in perfect focus. Is that amazing or not? Just amazing. This is an actual micro photograph. Can you see that some look like a rod and some look like a cone? Can you see that? Now let me show you something else that's amazing. This is a drawing on your left of a cone and on your right, I'm sorry, of a rod and on your right the cone. I think you can see from where you're sitting. Tell me if you can. Uh, can you see that there's kind of a little stack of pancakes on both the rod and the cone? Let me tell you something very interesting. This is so fascinating, it's almost unbelievable. Most of you have now a big flat screen TV on your wall in your house, and you may not know this, but there are actually 8 million little dots. And if you've got a magnifying glass, you should do this sometime. The dot actually has three little tiny parts. It can be red, green, or blue. And when you see a picture on that screen, eight million dots had to be told what color to look like. And do you know what? That is done 30 times a second. You're watching a video, 30 times a second. All eight million dots are a different color. And so you see something that looks like it's moving, right? And uh, in the case of the eye, however, it's not 8 million, it's 150 million. Amazing. But here's the issue. What happens is, I think I have an arrow for this. When a piece of light, if you will, hits that pancake, I, I hope you're with me, that pancake is at the end of the rod which is going to get the light, correct? What happens is a chemical reaction takes place in the pancake, which sends an electric signal down the wire to the brain. Y'all with me so far? Here's what happens, though. When that chemical reaction takes place, it gets, it's hot. It releases some heat. And pretty quick, the pancake falls apart and can't do any more. No problem. There's another pancake where? right below it. And uh, if you go outside on a really bright day, especially up where there's snow, all of you have heard about this, if not experienced it, and you got, maybe you didn't wear sunglasses and you got an awful lot of light, what might happen to you when you go home that evening? 
What do we call it? Snow blindness. This is what happens, folks. All the pancakes got used up. Not to worry. While you're sleeping tonight, your eye makes more pancakes. Now, you just think about that, folks. This is astonishing. Darwin knew none of this, none of this. And uh, the uh, title, of course, today, uh, that is the text, was fearfully and wonderfully made. I'd love to take more time on that phrase, but uh, it is an amazing story. There is, if you put your hand, it's about this big right there. That's That part of your brain, we call it the occipital lobe, is where all of these wires end up hooking up. And that part of your brain makes for you what you see all day long every day and probably don't give a thought. Amazing story. And it's even more interesting when you think about the fact the artist is trying to illustrate that from the left eye, if you want to call it that, he's colored half the optic nerve black to show you that it goes to the same side, whereas the other half of the optic nerve travels to the other side. Y'all with me on that? Can you all follow what I'm saying? Interestingly enough, and all of these things need a couple hours of explanation, but there is a synaptic connection twice before these signals get to the back of the brain. It is astonishing, folks, how we are created. Now, I want to tell you a story about Erwin Moon. Erwin Moon was a scientist, a believer in Christ, and had a burden to make science help people believe that they have a loving creator. And he... Uh, was part of the Moody Bible Institute and uh, created 18, listen folks, this, I'm so old that back in the day when I was a teacher, we used film. You kids don't even know what film is. <laughs> you old folks know what film is. You remember how you used to have to thread the film through the projector? And, and uh, I would show these films that, that uh, Dr. Moon made to my classes. I taught math, physics, astronomy, uh, electronics, and uh, those films were helpful in my mind in all of those uh, departments. And uh, Moody Bible Institute, they're not believers like Adventists are, but I'm telling you folks, there's a lot of wonderful Christian people out there in all these churches. Is that right? Wonderful Christian people. And our work is to minister to them and not try to show them that they're wrong but to try to come close to them so that when everything falls apart, and folks, I think it's awful close to falling apart right now. You think, folks, this is not in the notes today. You think about what's going on in this country. It is astonishing. The end is right upon us. And we have a work to do, folks, to gain the friendship and the confidence of these people. This afternoon at 4 o'clock, if you want to come, I'm going to talk with you about how how some of us do that, how you do that. I want to have you look at those issues with me. But in any case, uh, Irwin Moon did a lot of interesting things in, he, in these movies, but his whole purpose was to help people love Christ and believe in God more strongly because of the natural world. And here he is putting some uh, metal caps on his fingers, and he's standing on top of a Bandigaff generator, and he's about to turn... Uh, the power on, and uh, suddenly uh, all this high voltage is passing through his body, and he did things like this in these films. Now, one day, uh, he had his staff build, oh, here's the 18 films that he made. I used all of these in my classes over time. One of the ones I loved the most was something called Windows of the Soul, and in that film, he had his uh, staff make a device that put on his head, and about as long as that, on both eyes, was an optical device so that when he looked through them, he saw the world upside down and backwards. Got it? 
And his thinking was that uh, he wanted to know what would happen to the brain if the brain suddenly saw something backwards and upside down. I think all of you know that actually what you and I are looking at on the back of our eye is upside down. You know that, don't you? And somehow, the brain has inverted it because everybody looks right side up to me. <laughs> so uh, he put this on, and for six weeks, he never opened his eyes without either this being on, or in a moment I'll show you, he takes it off before, he, and he puts a mask on to go to bed or whatever, so that he only sees the world upside down for six weeks. Are you all with me on this? And uh, there he is uh, in the in this film he shows, they roll him a ball, he can't catch it. Um, and here he is, and he, he, he just doesn't work, because everything is left, right, and upside down. And as he, uh, how did it get that far? It shouldn't have gone that far. Let me try it again. I may have to. Um, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, 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 I have a slide of him walking down the street. I don't know why it's not showing up. He can, he just, he's going like this, you know, he's struggling. But as time went by, he, he got more and more used to this until finally, he could just walk down the street and have pictures of him. People are looking at him with this thing on his head. And then, he, then he's riding a motorbike, and then he's flying an airplane, and he's just gotten back now doing all the maneuvers you have to do to get a private license uh, with the world upside down and backwards. And so the news people are out there, uh, you know, making a record of this. Excuse me. Shall we? I was going to preach till the, till the candles got done. I was thinking about if this baby caught on fire or something. <laughs> oh, please. Now, back in 1974, there was a World's Fair in Spokane, Washington. You live so far where you probably didn't even know it. But uh, Upper Columbia Academy, where I was teaching, uh, is just a few miles outside of town. And... Uh, here is the uh, fairgrounds, and uh, in this building, it doesn't matter, the North American Division of Seventh-day Adventists had a display about as big as this sanctuary on health. And there were all kinds of stations where you could listen and watch and touch and whatever. Uh, it was all electronic kinds of stuff. And I suppose because I was teaching electronics at a nearby school, I, I don't even remember how it happened. I got contacted. Would I please go to the fair every day and make sure everything was working? So I had a pass, and I'd run in there, even when there were there were no classes. Uh, for well, there were in the fall, but anyway, I'd go in there and make sure everything was working and fix stuff if it wasn't, and so forth. Right nearby, you could just step out the door near where, kind of at one of the doors of of the Adventist uh, display. And you look out, I'm looking out that door. What do you see uh, written, if you can, on the wall of the, of the display next door to us? Sermons from Science. The very films that I was talking about. By the way, these are all available on YouTube. They're just still valid and fascinating, I think. How many have ever watched one of these, can I see it? Oh, look at this, about eight people. I should have the rest of you say you will go home and do it, but nevertheless. Uh, so if I had time, uh, even though I had seen these films, are we crazy? Did you ever watch this, another something the same again and then watch it again and so forth? I've done that. But anyway, I'd slip over there and sit down in their auditorium, and it was kind of like this. They had benches instead of seats because there would be a Moody Bible witness, witnessing person at the other end. At the end of the film, they turned to the person and say, did you enjoy that? And try to engage them. Y'all with me on the idea? It was a soul winning work they were doing, right? So I was over there one day, uh, sitting yeah, right about there, and there was this older man. I was a young man, but there was this older man with white hair that was walking around taking pictures with his camera. And uh, I, I kind of looked at him for a bit, and it dawned on me 
that there was something familiar about this man. And all of a sudden it hit me. That is Dr. Erwin Moon. 15 years after he made the films, and his hair, you may not have noticed, his hair in the film was, you know, uh, brown or whatever, but now it was white. I jumped out of my seat and I ran up and I said, Dr. Moon, I'm a physics teacher in a local high school. I use your films. Could we talk? He said, sure. He went outside, not far from where this picture is at, to the left, sat down. And the thing I want, I, I, would, I would have loved to talk to him, folks, for 24 hours. You watch some of these films that he's done. Just, they're just fascinating especially the one on bees and how they signal each other. It's just astonishing. What he shows from the scientific world that there is a creator. Anyway, I wanted to know how this worked. And, and, he, I, I, and he said, well, you know, after a while, it just became normal. And he could fly an airplane. He could ride a motorbike through a main, uh, you know, some cones and so forth. And, and, and he said, you know, if I walked into a room and maybe there was a picture, two, two copies, one right side up and one upside down, I couldn't maybe know which was which, but it, 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 was, it was working fine. And then I said to him, because the film stops, it's interesting why he stopped the film. What happened when you took them off? Now, these are his exact words. In fact, when I first sat down with him and started to speak, he thought I was going to do this to all my physics students. And he was very agitated for what he's about to tell me. He said, when, that, when those were taken off, and remember, he had not used his eyes for six weeks except to look through those, correct? When he took them off, these are his exact words. I'll never forget them. He said, in 30 seconds, I was a blithering idiot. And uh, there was a couple of physicians involved in his staff recognizing that there might be some kind of repercussion. They grabbed him and took him into a dark room and laid him down. This is what they figured out. You'll know what I mean if I tell you that he was actually sort of seeing tunnel vision. You all with me? like looking through a pair of binoculars, in a sense. And so what happened was his brain made the tunnel part become totally normal to him, just like you and I think we see things right side up, even though they're upside down in there. But the part that was not in the tunnel remained unchanged. You all with me on that? So suddenly now he saw both of them, and it drove him. Did you, ever use the, did you ever use the phrase, you're driving me crazy? Well, it did drive him crazy. But he doesn't say anything about that on the film. And so the chance for me to talk with him was just really precious. And he said it took him about six weeks. They had him in that dark room. Every day they would raise the light in the room just a smidgen and got him finally recovered. But the amazing thing, folks, is his brain <laughs> made it work. Uh, now let me close with a story that I think you'll find fascinating. Everyone in this room, parents particularly, are totally aware of the interesting pathway for a newborn baby to finally be able to speak. Correct? Uh, I, I, could, I bet every parent in this room remembers, I don't remember it for the second child and on. We only have two. I remember it for the first. I remember the very first sentence she ever made. Do you all remember that about your children? Of course you do. And uh, it, 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 they're, it, they almost have to be a year old before they can even start using words like mommy and daddy, don't they? It, it, it takes time to learn to talk. Y'all with me on this? And by the way, that's a field which scientists are totally unable to penetrate. They have no clue and see all the other animals on the face of the earth. You and I are animals. In fact, we're unclean animals. Did you know that? We don't have hoofs 
and we don't have scales or wings. Is that correct? In any case, all the other animals on the planet do not know how to talk. It's remarkable, folks, what, how far beyond animals that God has made you and me. Even though chimps and have brains that are somewhat similar to ours, and they can make certain sounds and so forth and communicate. But now here's what we did not know, and I'll just put the, the book on the screen, uh, and then I'm going to close the screen so you won't be distracted. But this book about a man who became blind at just several weeks and learned. Uh, he became an engineer. He became an inventor. He has the world record for the fastest blind skier, snow skier, 60 miles an hour. If I'm going 30 when I'm skiing, that's plenty. And here he is, a blind man, 60 miles an hour. Wake up. I'm sorry. I have to tease the kids some. So when he was about uh, 35 years old, uh, his ophthalmologist told him that there was a stem cell treatment that might, in the case of one of his eyes, the other one was more damaged, might be able to give him his vision back. And the question is, would he like to try that? Now, you might think that's a trivial decision. But after 35 years of being blind, you, 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 you ponder this. It was not a trivial decision. You all with me on this? So you've got to read the book. But let me tell you what we learned from that one case, and scientists have now explored this in more detail. Not only do children have to learn how to talk, this might surprise you, they have to learn how to see. You ever thought of that? When you have that little baby in your arms, uh, have you ever noticed its eyes just kind of wander around? And you're looking at the child's eyes, and what would you like the child to do? Make contact or focus, if you will, right? The child has not learned how to do that. And uh, we now know, this is amazing, folks, that there is a process in the brain where we think it's several trillion connections have to be cut off and other connections have to be formed in the process of the child learning to see. It's not that it's black. The child can't inter can interpret what it's seeing. So the day comes, maybe about six weeks, Little baby's in your arms, and its eyes fasten on you, and, and what does the baby do? Smiles. And when that baby first smiled, your heart leapt for joy, didn't it? So we serve an amazing creator, don't we, friends? And I share all this with you just to not only help cement your conviction uh, that there is a God who loves us, but that we might... How shall I describe this, folks? We might love him more day by day as we learn about his marvelous care for us. And the next thing I'd like to use it for is to encourage myself and you to be more and more able emissaries for his work. My topic this afternoon at 4 o'clock is the Lord wants to make an evangelist out of you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, O oh Lord, for your mighty hand, for your creative power. And in all of this, you made us to be loving creatures that we might not only love one another, but love our neighbor. And that you, we would learn have your presence in us to such a deep extent that everyone around us is influenced by your presence, Lord, and drawn to you. 
We praise your name for this plan. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.